Welcome to our Bible study kickoff tonight. Our celebration is different than a normal worship service. This is our Bible study kickoff celebration. And that song, it's, that, that's, that was an incredible song, guys. Last um, Bible study, we studied, as Dr. Glodo said, Habakkuk or Habakkuk. And that um, was depressing at times and very difficult. Um, part of the song that um, the musicians sang, uh, played was, um, We Will Feast and Weep No More. Uh, Philippians is a book of joy, and uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, living a joyful life of paradox. That's our theme this year. I invite you to stand for the call to worship. The call to worship is actually a prayer. 
and I'll read it from Philippians chapter 1, starting with verse 3. And the reason I'm reading this is that we would want this to be the result of your study, if you're studying Philippians, that this is what God would develop in you, a deeper love for him. So please hear God's word. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for allowing us to end this Lord's Day in celebration. Celebration not of our accomplishments, but of yours. Celebration not of our faithfulness, but of yours. Celebration of not of our future, but of the blessed hope that we await the return of our Savior. And Father, I pray that as we sing this song of celebration that uh, our hearts would arise, we would be lifted in worship, even as we worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
be seated. Because this is a uh, special service, I'm going to invite the parents to dismiss the children who are going to children's program at this time. And we'll start a PowerPoint. So I just saw a parent come in with a little child, and I should have said, wait. <laughs> One, one of the things I enjoy most is seeing the children run out. Not because I want them to leave, it's just the... <laughs> it's the excitement. <clears throat> so this year, uh, this uh, spring, we're studying Philippians, living a joyful life of paradox. And we have several Bible study leaders. And if you're a Bible study leader, would you stand up just where you are? I know you're here. Yes, great. Come on up. Oh, yeah, we're going. Oh, you'll uh, get a, a brief introduction on what these groups are. Uh, notice the names of the leaders. When you have questions, those are the ones that you contact. I want you to know ahead of time that sometimes some of our groups, um, parish groups, will not study Philippians. So if you're interested in Philippians in a particular group, contact on the leader and ask. And if you're having trouble finding a men's group or a women's group that um, studies Philippians, call me, call Amber or Liz, and we will direct you gladly. So let me, uh, um, next slide, please. Jay Miller <laughs> is, um, for many of us, he's known, uh, but he is uh, a, the pastor of Parkway. He's a lead pastor, and they, they meet in, um, in uh, that place in Georgia, uh, in the state of Georgia. Where is that? Atlanta, right? <laughs> He has a Master of Divinity's degree from Erkson University. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Communications from Florida State. He previously served in this church and in uh, the church uh, of Redeemer in Evans. Before coming to ministry, he was a seventh grade educator and he was a sports anchor. And I think this is so cool. I hope you use your sports anchor voice sometime tonight but the uh, sports anchor for WRDW in Augusta, Georgia. He and his wife have been married for 20 years. Amy is here, and so thank you, Amy, for coming as well. Uh, they have five children, Grant, Lily Reese, Sadiq, Lila, and Hazel. Did I say that all right? Excellent. And so we're, we're going to turn the service over to him, the program over to him in a little while, not right now, but in a little while. Um, but uh, we are so grateful that he is here uh, to lead us. I'm going to invite Amber to come on up and let us know about our women's groups. All right. Thank you, Ken. And I just want to say I'm really excited that Jay and Amy are here. They have been longtime friends of ours. In fact, John and I were at Jay and Amy's wedding, and I was just telling the story the other day that I have never seen a man cry so ugly and so beautifully in my entire life. <laughs> just, the, Jay has a, a love uh, that extends itself in vibrant emotion, be it sadness or joy. So I know you're gonna enjoy hearing from him today. I just wanted, ladies, to give you a brief overview of the studies that we have going on for the women. And there's a couple ways that you can think about which studies should I be involved in or could I be involved in. One, obviously, is when am I available? And so we do have morning studies and we have, how do you switch this, Ken? Uh, swipe it. I swipe it. Yes. All right, evening studies, too. All right, it's not the same on my thing as it is on there, but that's all right. Oh, it's not. Okay, it's not supposed to be. All right, so morning and evening. And how do I get back to morning? There, there I am. I may not switch again. All right, way more complicated than I feel like it should be. Uh, morning studies and evening studies. So morning studies, 
The morning study that's a little bit original is our Wednesday morning study, and you'll notice that it meets from 9.30 to 11.30. If you're at the stage of life where you have that type of time, it's a, what's unique about it is it includes a lecture time and a small group discussion time. So there's a group of women who have been teaching together, some of us for five to 10 years together. They meet weekly during the semester to grow together in understanding the Lord's word and their ability to communicate it. And so they teach for the first part and then they break up into various small groups. It's different women, different ages, stages, and childcare is provided. So Wednesday morning is unique in that offering. You'll see the other morning study there is Claire Weaver National Parish, and they meet from 6 to 7 a.m. So if you are an early bird, and that is the time that you can make it, what I love about their group is they really get up and they take care of business in that hour, and yet they're deep and rich and connected to each other's lives as well. So it's a couple morning offerings. Let's see if it will like me. Yeah. Good. Okay, and then you'll see our evening offerings as well, and one is an afternoon. So you have Sunday evening here at the church with Susie Vital, and that's a great time. Again, it's an hour before evening service. They do the same thing. It, they get right down to it, and yet they are connected to one another, uh, a deep and rich study, prayer time together. So that's a good time if you need something that fits with the schedule. Maybe you work a lot of evenings. And you'll see Monday evening studies, young adults studies take place on that Monday. Tuesday, you've got South Carolina Super Parish, Columbia County Parish, and Tuesday evenings, and then Thursday afternoon, Lake Forest Parish. So you'll notice that I'm mentioning a couple things, days, times, and then you see the parishes highlighted. I want to point out the parishes. If you're interested in doing a Bible study near where you live, then joining one of these parish studies uh, that is your parish is a great option. But at the same time, not all of these parish studies just have women who belong to that parish in them. They are open uh, and already have members from different areas. And so if that time works for you, but you're not a part of that parish, they would love for you to sign up as well. Because the other thing is sometimes, who do you already have a natural connection to? Who do you know? What's a name that's familiar to you? Do you have a friend that's going to a particular study? That's a great way to choose a group as well. So these groups are all open, but that's just, we do that by parish just so you know that those are available particularly in your area, if that's something that you're interested in. And then the last thing I wanted to say too is if you would like to host a Bible study in your home, if you'd like to be a Bible study leader on a Wednesday morning, come see me afterwards or get in contact with me. You can find me on the church website and email me. I would love to know of your interest. Or if you would just like to do Bible study with a group of friends, you don't really necessarily want it to be official, but you would like to be resourced and connected and in contact with some leaders as well and have that opportunity available to you, also get in touch with me. I'd love to just resource you. You don't have to be anything official and we can kind of come alongside you and give you some of those things as well. All right, thanks. So I'll ask uh, that we advance through these next couple of slides quickly. We have co-ed groups, and then we have men morning groups and evening groups. I'm going over it quickly because you can access the information of these groups from our website. Uh, and I want to give Jay uh, adequate time uh, to present. Uh, let me, could you advance to the next one and the next one? Great, strength and courage. I wanna highlight this for our men. The Strength and Courage um, Men's Conference, February, February 3rd, there's a $10 charge. Um, please sign up. Dr. Uh, Sean Bra uh, Brower will be uh, giving this talk, Reclaiming Biblical Masculinity. I'm looking forward to that, so please, guys, um, mark that in your calendar, sign up for that, and make sure that you're taking advantage of that opportunity. And then the next thing I wanna briefly mention, uh, not only do we have Bible studies, but we have G3 groups. G in the G3 groups stands for gospel-centered groups. And the three describes the three different groups that we have. We have process groups, we have recovery groups, and we have support groups. Um, please check out our website to find out which group is currently uh, meeting. And if you have a need and a concern um, that you would like us to start a new group, please follow the link on the website uh, and contact our um, 
a pastor of care, and he will make sure that you're connected. So without further ado, it is my pleasure and joy to present to you Pastor Jay Miller. Hello, welcome. Hey, let me take a look at you. Such an incredible privilege <clears throat> to be here, to be back among you. Um, we're going to be looking at Philippians, and um, I started at the, in North Atlanta, uh, Forsyth County, our church, Parkway Presbyterian Church, and I started as a new head pastor February of 2020, and and then a month later, the world went like subterranean, you know? And so I was a new head pastor for one month, then I was like a televangelist for the next <laughs> six months, and, which is big in Atlanta. They, they're big into that, so, but not so many with my people. So then like we had 26 people. Uh, I think they call that church revitalization. It's like Scottish revitalization. I was shrinking the church. And um, <clears throat> so then we started preaching through Philippians. So I preached through during COVID this, this incredible letter. And, but I want you all to know that I stand here under the heresy crusher having been a part of this church since my salvation. Uh, I met Christ here. <laughs> John Franks, if he's here, they had an over under on how long it would take for me to cry. It was... <laughs> It was during the hymn when I heard everyone saying, arise and shake off your guilty fears. It's like tears are running down my face. I'm like, get it together, man. So uh, I've done everything. I've set up for weddings here. Um, I've uh, uh, been uh, over there in that room. I've been over there in those offices. I've been over here. Um, I've done everything. Uh, Erskine Seminary was because... Uh, we established at First Pres a relationship with Erskine Seminary. So when Paul is thinking about his relationship with the Philippian church, y'all, it's just, I, the best degree, I know what he felt because when I think about y'all, I think of the same. I think exactly the same. That, have you ever been like prayed for by Ken McHurd? We have two foster kids. And we came back in, in their and prayed for them, that we would be able to adopt them. Have you ever been taken out for a bagel with Mike Heron and him have a plan for your life, you know? <laughs> have, you, have you ever had a salad with Mike Phillips and hear his voice in your life of encouragement? Have you ever been able to work for John Franks? It's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> And every single church employee that's terrible at their job, I think you would be less terrible if you worked with John Franks. Like, he would not tolerate that level of incompetence, and he would let you know about it to your face. Like, I've been cared for by this church in ways when I was in seminary, and my internet search history was wicked and disastrous and sinful and adulterous. And one of the most terrifying and heartbreaking things that had happened in our youth ministry happened, and this church sent me away with an individual who was hurting. And it saved my life and my marriage and my ministry, and you all set, sent me bon voyage, good luck with that sexual sinner. And the whole time, it, it was, I was one of, I was with him. And I got to finally tell the truth. It, when this amazing, precious, heartbroken young man was experiencing what he was experiencing, someone said, are you here for him or for, or for you? And I got to finally tell the truth. And I began to experience the power of the truth in community. That's the message of, of Philippians. Am I out here? Is it okay? It, it's okay? It's just me? Cool. All right. Um, so I want you all to know that when I think about you, I am overjoyed. I can't stand here 
if it's not for first prayers. I, I can't stand here. I can't be here. I can't speak to you with the hope and love and joy that I have in my heart without you all and the ministry that this we stand on. So I'm going to do an overview. And at, at some point, I'm going to, I just, I'd like to read the entire letter once we get a little bit into it. But I think I have trivia questions or something after that. Is that right, Ken? Yeah. You didn't know. Once I sort of, the plane takes off, I like go, man. Like it's, uh, all right. So I have four trivia questions. The first one is, we read about Paul founding the church in, in Philippi in the book of Acts. Which chapter? 16. Who said it? Way up there, Ken. Can you make it? Okay, there you go, love it. All right, how many times does the word joy in its cognates, uh, joy appear in the English translation of this letter? How many? 15, that's right. 15, did someone say 15? Yes. This is great. Love it. Um, what scripture reference from Philippians tattooed on UFC champion John Jones' chest? 413. Philippians 413. A bonus, which NBA star has created a brand around that same verse? Steph Curry. I don't, that doesn't win you anything except accolades. And then lastly, um, Who's been arrested and jailed more, UFC champion John Jones or the Apostle Paul? It's a trick question. Tie, five, both five, arrested and jailed five times. I think it was a little fellow back there. Uh, I just want to see you throw it to the balcony again. <laughs> it's great. Here it comes. I love it. Right into the. Great. So, let me pray, and then we'll just we'll, we'll just I gotta set it all down. It's getting a little rowdy in here. This is Presbyterians. Let me pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And in the time you've given us, um, God, we're gonna just be amazed. <laughs> we're gonna be amazed at your grace. It really was, Lord, sitting here, hearing your people on your day singing praises at night. It was like water to my soul to hear the church resounding with praise. And I know some of these people, uh, but I feel like I know all of them. And many of them may have lots of reasons not to be singing. And maybe they were borrowing the songs and the faith and the hope and the love of their brothers and sisters in this room. Maybe they were singing with expectation, singing through tears and grief, singing, hoping that there would be a realization. So God, arise, help us to shake off our guilt, guilty fears and rise. We need more than anything to hear you from your word. And it's gonna be an overview, but God, when we let let these scriptures guide us. Let this, let this settle in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Paul in, in Acts is, is moving out. He was zealous. Paul was raised a Pharisee. Paul was born in Tarsus, and he got accepted to the best law school in Tarsus, but not just any law, God's law school. And he was being equipped to help with zeal to bring in the kingdom by his holiness, by his righteousness, by his performance. He was going to be the one that helped protect the world as a pure scene, as a pure one. He was going to, by his zeal, protect the world so that the Messiah might come. And he had been schooled in such a way, he was accepted into Gamaliel's school. And Gamaliel was the preeminent teacher of God's law, of God's people. 
Paul was on the fast track. He was on his way to be the one who would prepare the world for Messiah. And he was there when he found out about what God had been doing and what he began to protect it because there was this sect of this rabbi who started to claim godhood and then he claimed to be resurrected. And then those followers claimed that they saw him alive. So Paul gathered together with all of his zeal, he gathered together a group of people and they began persecuting, not just the men, but the the women and the children and they dragged them out. And, And they would be saying, this must stop. And then on his way, as they gathered together to assemble together to kill and persecute more of these followers of way, these atheists, Paul said, well, we have to go up to Antioch, but Paul, you're from Tarsus, so will you take the Damascus road? Will you head that way? And you, we'll head him off at the pass. And that's where Jesus met Saul of Tarsus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And see, God was revealing himself in the resurrected Christ to, 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 to Saul himself. And Jesus so identified with his own people that he said, why are you persecuting me? That was Jesus' question to Saul. And Saul was blinded. And then he found his way to a group of friends. And those friends began to love him. And they're like, take care of Saul. You mean the, the killer, Christian killer, the terrorist? When anybody thought of Saul of Tarsus, they thought law and terror. But the church began to nurture Saul who was better than everybody else in his own mind, but he began to see he was the greatest of sinners, that he fell so far short. So he he began to tell a story. He began to stand up and be welcomed in to the people who had walked with Jesus, Jesus Jesus' friends. And he began to go on missionary journeys because they were kind of pushing him out. And it went well, and he planted a church. And he showed up. They didn't even have 10 Hebrew men. Not enough to have uh, a, a, a synagogue. There weren't even enough 10. It was an old Roman colony. All the retired military guys would take their pension and live there. He couldn't find 10 Jewish men. That's always where he would go. He'd show up at a synagogue and he'd begin thinking, how do I find the Jews to point them to the true Messiah, to Jesus Christ, the one who visited me, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures? He couldn't find them. So he went by the riverside and he found a woman. She was a a fashionista. She was wealthy. She was powerful. She was leading a Bible study. She was a God-fearer. She had known, and and Paul began to point this woman to the Scriptures and point him to his Lord and her Lord and Savior, Jesus. She became converted, and she opened up her house. She became the first host to say, you can begin to meet here with me. And then he walked a little further, and he found a, a slave girl who was imprisoned and being exploited and they used her for divination she had masters and these diviners were the people that began to use her to tell the fortune and she was their industry sex slavery divination power it happened then too and paul said and i love this in in acts 16 17 he was angry at her (laughs) he converts her out of anger it's in the scriptures. Paul's motivation is out of rivalry and bitterness. He goes, would she just shut up? Jesus, will you save her? So she shuts up and she's freed. And she's the second convert in Philippi. And then they begin to arrest him because he's setting the economy in a city that wants to be little Rome. He upsets the economy, so they throw him in jail with his buddy and the, the jailer Figures in the middle of the night, these guys are going to keep quiet, but they keep singing songs. And then suddenly there's a great quake and a, and a storm and the doors are opened. And he's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to kill myself because once the doors open, all the prisoners flee. And Paul and his buddy said, we're still here. We're still here. We didn't leave. And the Philippian jailer, this old retired military guy says, why would you stay? And I say essentially for you. And they begin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ who would love a Gentile like him. And he accepts Christ. He and his whole household, he and his whole household are baptized. And so Paul and this church began a relationship and he continues on in his journey. And 10 years later, he writes them this letter. 
He writes them Philippians. And it's a story where he begins to understand what they're going through. And he's speaking from a jail. Scholars would say, is it Ephesus? Is it Rome? I love to think that it's in Rome because that means that Epaphroditus is traveling by sea about 850 miles there and back several times. Not If it was Ephesus, it would be about 300 miles. But it, it's probably in Rome, 850 miles by sea there and back because Epaphroditus loves Paul. And Paul loves Epaphroditus. And so that's where we have this this message. We have the letter of Philippians. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read it. You guys okay with that? I mean, it's Sunday night. What else you got going on? We're just gonna read the entire, uh, the entire letter. And then I've got some things. They made me do a PowerPoint. <laughs> it's the worst part. Some of you guys are like, I, I'm scared of like public speaking. Sign me up. PowerPoint? Golly, that's my sanctification right there. This is uh, not good. And people were like, oh, I would help you. I would help you. Uh, I don't know how to ask for help. It's either. I don't know how to ask for help. So, so turn with me in your copies of God's Word. I'm going to be reading the uh, ESV. I think that's the, that's the one you guys read from. Galatians, Ephesians. I didn't turn to it. Philippians. We're going to read the whole thing. You guys okay with that? Just the entire letter. Then I've got some overview. And then... I, like we're going to be done. We'll see. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. I want you all to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that will with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And if I am to live in this flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I chose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to part and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. Because of my coming to you again, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Did I say I'm gonna read the whole Bible, uh, the whole letter? Let's just pause at chapter one. That was, you know, that was a bite. So let's go here. Paradox. Living a life in tension. I'm gonna give you three poles that are gonna hold in tension that you and I are gonna to wanna to reduce. But chapter one leads to two, leads to three and four, and you're gonna see these three issues as you're doing the study, as you're reading personally, as you're gathering in small groups, as you're considering this. You're gonna be thinking about three things, living in tension. You're gonna to wanna to reduce one to the, to the detriment of the other, and God invites us to hold these things in tension. Identity, who you are, Paul will, in this letter, begin to remind people who they are, their relationship and their locationship. That's who they are formed to be, who they are. Community, identity and community. Another poll that's going to be holding Philippians together is who you are with, your partners and the promises you as a community live by. These define our current state and they've always defined us. Who you are and who you are with. The relationships and the ties that bind you and where the location, what, what is it you build your identity around and your community. The partners that you're with and the promises that you all live by. And then a third pole that Paul will always be weaving in and out of is responsibility. What you are to do. And Christian tradition has sometimes removed one or the other. If it just lives in community or responsibility, it tends towards moralism. If it's just identity and responsibility, it tends to be towards individualism. If it's only identity and community and not responsibility, then you can kind of err where oftentimes we err, which is we have the orthodox faith, we are a group, but we're not moving in such a way where the world is improved and bettered and beautified by our love. So this, we have to hold all three of these, and Paul, through Philippians, will be addressing who you are, who you're with, and what your responsibility is to do, what you're to do. Sometimes we're afraid of what I'm to do, because it's like, well, but what about righteousness, and what about for me to live? There's a lot of ways we, weigh, we avoid responsibility, and I've begun to learn in my life I can take responsibility for my life. God has given me agency. He's freed my will in the gospel. He hasn't left me on my own. The abounding love and the glory and praise of God, that's our responsibility as God's people. Who you are, who you are with, and what you are to do. Philippians is rich to answer all three of these things together. Identity, who you are, your relationship, and your locationship. Uh, uh, maybe I'll explain that a little. So my son Grant is a wrestler. And, um, you know, he's a senior starting a 150-pounder. The, the West Forsyth High School just won the region champion, and we're headed to state next week. We're excited about that. And um, so I'm showing up to all of his wrestling meets, and some of the mat is so long. It's like this forever. It's like we're just sitting there. It's hours and hours, like seven hours. I thought like, you know, soccer or baseball was long, but like this was like so long. And, but we're, I'm sitting there, and one of the elders in our church 
uh, named Billy Seville, who was at Lookout Mountain for a little while. He kind of helped bring me along at Parkway at the church where I was. He was uh, competed for an attempt. He won the Army Championship in 1972 and was almost going to go to the, the, the Olympics in 1972. He won, and he's maybe the greatest wrestler. Well, he's essentially Grant's coach, and he's his cheerleader, and he's been a referee in the community for a long, long time. But anyway, Billy sits there with me, and I'm, I'm there cheering my son on. These three things kind of happened to me. My son Grant looks at me and I, I said, Grant, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. And he says, Dad, your breath is terrible. <laughs> what? There's another image about wrestling that I've learned that not only is my breath terrible, but there was, he was competing in this individual tournament and he was fighting for this, really, this high ranking place, but all, the, all of his teammates were around. There's a bunch of guys on the team. So this coach was over there, this coach was over there, and the coach, you sit in the corner, was sitting right there and it was, the, the seat was empty. The coach seat was empty. So Grant's like, Dad, you get to sit there. I'm like, whoa, I step out on the mat and I sit there and Grant fights his hard fight and he wins, he wins. And so there's this kind of the way that you go through it is the coaches shake hands and the guy that's, the guys go shake the coach's hand. So I, like, I'm watching Grant. I'm like, you got this, buddy. You got this, buddy. And, and he won. And then everybody's like congratulating me because I was sitting in the coach's seat. It, it, that's the gospel. Your breath stinks. And sit there, watch me work and receive all of the accolades and the congratulations. But one more thing, when I'm sitting there with Billy, this incredible wrestler, uh, all kinds of famous guys know him and he's invested in communities in his 70s and unbelievable. He said, Jay, you know what amazes me? Growing up, I never heard I love you. And when your son leaves to like go do wrestling, he like says, I love you. And then you say it back. Uh, in an arena full of competition and sweat and ego and exertion of energy, there's just this beautiful connection between you and your son, Jay. It's, it's amazing. That's, it's an image where you can enter in and hear, I love you. Sit there and watch me work. And your breath stinks. And they all three are true. That's the kind of identity we get. Uh, psychiatrist William Sadler, a clear conscience is the greatest step toward barricading the mind against neuroticism. Paul, in this letter, will begin to talk about who we are, about how we are to form ourselves, about how we are to see ourselves. You're going to see that over and over and over in this letter. You're going to see that you can have a clear conscience. A.W. Tozer, look at this. How unutterably sweet is the knowledge that our Heavenly Father knows us completely. No talebearer can inform on us. No enemy can make an accusation stick. No forgotten skeleton can come tumbling out of some hidden closet to abash us and to expose our past. No unsuspected weakness in our characters can come to light to turn God away from us since he knew us utterly before he knew him and called us to himself in the full knowledge of everything that was against us. For me to live is Christ. He who began a good work in you will see it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You, you know, Amazing Grace, John Newton, he wrote this song because he was in a ship and it was getting tossed back and forth. He wrote it because God preserved him and sa saved him from his death. He was a slave trader. The ship was a slave trading ship full of human beings in their own excrement being carried like cattle across the sea and God saves him and he writes amazing grace. And he stays a slave trader for seven more years. He writes the poem Amazing Grace. And then he stays a slave trader, leading slave trading ships for seven more years. Do you know why he stops? Because of health issues. John Newton would not tear apart and participate in human... He wouldn't speak up against the human slave trade 
for another 40 years. Do you know that? That song, Amazing Grace, is God beginning a good work in John Newton and seeing it to completion. <laughs> Every time you sing that, it was inspired by a man who God saved his life. And it took him another 40 years before God saved his life. And that can be forgiven too. God is intentional about building an identity that is beyond what you can earn or achieve for yourself or what your 401k or how your kids are doing or what school they got into. You're safe and secure based not on how many followers or likes or any little hits of dopamine that you're trying to build a self out of. God says, I know you and I am committed to you. J.I. Packer, these are all British people. You have to take them seriously. I wish I spoke with a, a Scottish accent. It's like a $10,000 raise in the Presbyterian church. <laughs> Nobody can produce new evidence of your depravity that will make God change his mind. God justified you with eyes wide open. You and I have an identity in Christ that is secure. You're safe. You're safe. Johan Harari, who's not a Christian in this story, Lost Connections, tells a story. Secondly, uh, when we think about identity, we also have community. So instead of seeing your depression and anxiety as a form of madness, I would tell my younger self, you need to see the sanity in this sadness. You need to see that it all makes sense. Of course, it's excruciating. I will always dread that pain returning every day of my life. But that doesn't mean the pain is insane or irrational. If you touch your hand to a burning stove, that too will be agony. And you will snatch your hand away as quickly as possible. That's a sane response. If you kept your hand on the stove, it would burn and burn until it was destroyed. We have an identity. We have been disconnected from God. And so your anxiety and depression are messengers of you saying you've been cut off. It's not just something to medicate away or to pray away, although medication and prayer are essential. But it's a part of you saying something about me is crying out for Christ and his people. Something in me is burning. Do not be anxious about anything but through prayer and petition. Present your request to God and he will exalt you. Paul knows what it's like to experience being cut off and experiencing the anxiety. Our anxiety is a warning signal, a messenger, a warning light saying, pay attention. You're feeling what you need to feel. Something is not right. You do not feel safe. Let's pursue the means that God has provided so that you might repent of building an identity on your own and be loved and cared for as you are where you are so that you can move to where God wants you to be by his grace, in his timing. And maybe you just need to be known in your sadness and in your fury and in your awareness. You might just need to be known right there. You don't have to perform because we have an identity that's been given to us in Christ. You're gonna find that in the letter from Paul to the Philippians. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century priest and theologian, we see people all around us who are feverishly seeking for purpose in their life, pursuing happiness and looking for relief from guilt to silence the pangs of conscience. We see people searching for the things that we know can only be found in Christ, but we make the gratuitous assumption that because they are seeking the benefits of God, they must be seeking God. That is the very dilemma of the fallen creature. We want the things that only God can give, but we do not want him. Paul will address this longing. Not that I have already obtained it, but I press on to make Christ Jesus my own. Not just the assurance, not just the forgiveness, not just the feeling of knowing that I've got the right orthodox theology, but I have Christ. If I have him, I have everything I need. If I don't have him, I have nothing that I need. This is what you will find in the letter from Paul to the Philippians. John Stott in the book, Confess Your Sins, quoting the head of a large British hospital, I could dismiss half my patients tomorrow if they could be assured of forgiveness. 
that's available to you in the gospel. And as you study this in community, you'll experience that you not only have forgiveness, but you are forgivable. You can face the reality. Your identity, your relationship, who you are, whose you are, your locationship. Uh, The reality is that God, through Paul, wants to say to you, you are, look even at the beginning of Philippians chapter 1. It says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Do you see that? In Christ Jesus at Philippi. So there's two groups of people here tonight. They are in Christ Jesus at Augusta. Or you're in something else or someone else. You're in yourself. And you're just at church. Paul, in the letter from from prison to Philippi, will say, you can transfer your trust from everything about you and you can be in Christ wherever you are. And then an identity is built on who has claimed you, who says you are beloved. Every chapter, one, two, three, and four, will all begin Paul saying, beloved of God. Community, who you're with. This is another poll that will be held up as partners and promises. Working this out, Euodia and Syntyche, I, I plead with you that you would be reconciled. And he, God, through Paul, applies cosmic truth to two women that are in conflict. And we'll fast forward through that. Viktor Frankl, who survived through the, the Holocaust, I will never be held accountable for what was done to me, but will always be responsible for what I do in return. Many of us are wrestling with what's happened to us in community, and we're living in a world where we choose shame, it's my fault, or blame, it's your fault. God invites us out of that and says, you're going to be held responsible for what you're doing, who knows you, what's happening, not how you're over-spiritualizing it or under-spiritualizing it, but how you're living in light of what has happened. And sometimes it's terrible what happened. Are you known in that? I don't want you all to just go through the motions and go through the verses. I want you to find opportunities to say to somebody, hey, can I share something with you? This kind of uncovered something in me as I was considering how Paul was writing to the Philippians. This conflict reminds me of a conflict. Fast forward. here, Here, this one, blah, 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 city of man, consequences, political, executed, yada, yada, says what Walter Brueggemann says. The church meets to imagine what our lives can be like if the gospel were true. Come on. That's beautiful. This is what we're doing. This old pastor who's in the middle of a church revitalization, I'd write a book. It would be called How to Save a Church Trying to Kill Itself. And it's like the only way forward is falling backwards. Like that's our first chapter. It's like it's a mess, and I got to come with you, and we got to imagine what it would be like if we could shake off our because. That's true. That's the real version of who we are. You all got to sing to me. We got to meet tonight to imagine what our lives would be like. What we're po- what, what's, what's possible in our lives if the gospel were true? Because it is. Community. Who you're with. You need partners. And you need to live in light of God's promises. You need that. You need to speak out into the world the realities of who you are. Stop pretending. You need to be known. If you are not known, you are pretending. If you are pretending, Jesus cannot meet you in your pretending. He can only meet you as you really are. And who you really are is worth knowing. Paul will allow you, give you permission to tell the truth. Because he began to tell the truth about himself. I had lots of reason to boast. I had a record that was built up, but it was all scubalon. It was all garbage. It was all excrement. It was all useless. It was dung. It was garbage. Who I was. For me to live is Christ. Your community is your partners and promises. And then responsibility. 
What are you to do? Abounding love and the glory and praise of God. The reason that you and I, we only have information. It hasn't moved into wisdom and knowledge and knowing is because we haven't suffered enough. I think I, I'm, a, I'm a far worse pastor than my Karen is because I haven't suffered as much as Mike. I haven't walked in the steps that Ken McCurd has walked. I, I haven't, I, I'm like, I showed up and I declared martial law at a church and I just started saying, I know what's up because I listened to George Robertson preach for 10 years and I was at a church plan and I knew what's going on and I can't believe that at Redeemer, so I'm gonna do better. And I just started bossing everybody around and I started to suffer. And my sister, who's in charge of like a um, uh, uh, beer distributor, she's uh, like the HR director of the largest one in Florida. She said during COVID um, that like bars were closed and restaurants were closed, but their business was up 40%. I was the one contributing to that. Um, my drinking went way up during COVID. Because I was so busy and so hectic and so frantic, I would fill garbage cans with bottles and cans. It, my wife walked into me one time, practically passed out. Shower on, door locked. She was terrified. I began to ask, have to ask for help. I had a responsibility. I, I had to say, who am I? Who am I with? Who knows what I'm facing? And I'm suffering. And I'm trying to medicate with alcohol. I was just doing the old strategies. Pain insists on being attended to. This sounds like a lot like Yohal Harari was saying about anxiety. When you're facing pain, stop ignoring it. Stop medicating it. Stop denying it with pills and, and, and purchases and pornography. Stop. Face it. Say, I must be known. I must throw this up and eat good food. Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, will address how your responsibility to tell the truth of what's happening in your life. Gosh, that's way too long. <laughs> it was a very significant quote. The way of the dragon or the way of the lamb, searching for Jesus' path of power in a church that has abandoned it. That's a title. Anyway. Responsibility. I was going to try to be prophetic, Mike. You know, like I show up as a guest, I just get to drop bombs and then leave. But uh, anyway, y'all keep doing what you're doing and step into this community in radical, generous, generous ways. Go. What's it going to cost you? Everything. What do you gain? Maybe nothing except Christ. He's worth it by far. Who you are, who you're with, and what you're to do. Growth and suffering, the church and the world, by grace through faith. I, I think that's it. Jesus is who you can be. You can take hold of him and everything that was his can become yours. You can let go of all that you are and you can receive all that God is in Christ. Who you're with, we never leave this journey outside of Christ. He's with us. He holds us. He secures us. Your community is Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll read that in the letters, in the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And what are you to do? You're to bring honor and glory to your Savior, Jesus Christ, who has loved you and gave himself for you. He is your life. You'll see that as you experience life transformation in this gospel. I, I'll close with this story. I, uh, I'm, not only do I have bad breath, apparently, but I'm also a terrible singer. And I was celebrating with our worship leaders, Shane and E.B. Cole, for their birthday. And I was singing to him, happy birthday. And um, I did not sing that great. And E.B. is like kind of very, very incredible as a singer. And she said, oh, I saw what you were doing. You, and I, I'm probably going to get this wrong. I mean, uh, oh, I saw what you were doing. You were singing the harmony. <laughs> and I was singing horribly. Not the harmony. I was singing horribly. But her beautiful voice drew me out. I just had to sing and sing to my friend. 
with my voice, and it just was terrible. But her, the beauty of her voice b- drew me out <laughs> to sing to my friend to honor him, and she even had a word of blessing for me. The, the gospel tells you your breath stinks. Everything you're doing is building a life that will be ruinous if you're on your own. And if you're on your own, if you don't have anybody that knows you and is experiencing you, you're going to be ruined. And if you're just living in a world where your only responsibility is to you and your family, you're going to experience ruin because it's going to collapse around you. Christ saw you and stepped into the world and said, you're worth it. Sing to me, even with your voice. Sing to me. You can sing horribly, and I'll call it the harmony, and I want to hear your words of praise. Because, like Paul said, at the end of time, Paul's joy and crown was going to be those people. Paul tells us in his letter that as he gathers at the end of time, he can't wait to see the Philippians. And I tell you all... <laughs> Whatever I'm doing in ministry, wherever I go, to be united with you all and welcomed back when I never deserved to ever stand here or there or do anything with y'all that you welcomed me and cared for me. I can't wait at the end of time to celebrate all that we've done together for Christ. All we are to him. All he has done for us and all as we've lived our lives in such a way that we brought praise, honor, and glory to our great Savior. From beginning to end, grace and peace. Paul was known as law and terror and he writes a letter to his friends, grace and peace. You're saved by grace through faith. No more law and terror. From beginning to end, this letter is one of grace, God's riches given to you in Christ, and peace, wholeness, and shalom in Christ. Let me pray. Father, would you give us what we stand in need of, that we would experience this letter in community, that we would be united in ministry and industry and responsibility, that you would shape and form us to move out into the world. Help us to ask questions and be asked of. Let let our very lives be questioned. Let us hear from you. Let us be healed by you. Let us be known by you as we're known in this community. We needed one another. For Paul to need Epaphroditus was not his imperfection, but was his his perfection. It was his created goodness. He was ruined as he was cut off, and he was healed as he was connected to your people and your gospel and your, your son, Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, thank you so much for this moment that we can sit together. Thank you for the attention of your people, these precious people at First Pres. God, we we look forward to what this semester, this time, this spring is going to mean for us. What a privilege and honor it is to stand here with these people under your word, under your authority. Speak, Lord, to us. Your servants are listening, for it's in the name of Christ we speak. Amen. Two quick announcements. Please join us in the commons for cookies. And if you have any questions about Bible study, we have our team there ready to answer questions. If you have a little, if you have a ball, you answered a question, see me in the commons. We have a gift for you. I invite you to stand as we sing, I am resting, resting. Oh, how great.
afterwards. If you want to have information about the small groups, see Amber, see Ken. It's such a privilege because I was ordained at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, so it is my distinct honor as an ordained minister to pronounce the benediction, the good word over you, precious people. Let me invite you to stretch forth your hands to receive God's benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Go in that peace. Amen.